Please remain standing as we sing the hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing. The Honorable Colin Jordan, Member of Parliament, Minister of Labour, Social Partnership, Relations and the Third Sector. Her Honour, Senator Miss Elizabeth Thompson, Deputy President of the Senate. Other members of the Senate, Mr. Corey Lane, Parliamentary Secretary, Ministry of 
People Empowerment and Elder Affairs and Member of Parliament for the City, the Honorable David Comachon, Barbados Ambassador to CARICOM, Guest Speaker for this evening's proceedings, Dr. Stephen Walcott, Madam Justice Sonia Richards, Archdeacon Eric Lynch of the Anglican Church, Reverend Derek A. Richards, President of the South Caribbean District Conference and Superintendent of the James Street Circuit, of the ministerial staff and their spouses. Ladies and gentlemen who are with us in the chapel and those who are viewing via the YouTube here in Barbados and in the region. We are extending a warm Methodist welcome to all of you to the 14th Annual Memorial Lecture in honor of the right excellent Sarah Ann Gill, National Heroine of Barbados, which will be presented by Dr. Stephen Walcott on the theme, And Can It Be? Performing Barbadian Identity Through Sacred Music. At this time, I invite Reverend Al Walcott, Minister in the James Street Circuit, to invoke God's blessings on these proceedings. Bless you. Good evening, everyone. Let us go to God in prayer. God, our God, we are in awe of your presence. We've come again, Lord, this evening to acknowledge you as the God who have journeyed with us throughout the years as a Methodist community, a community of faith. We've come this evening, Lord, to reflect on the rich heritage that you have given us as your people, the people called Methodists. And even this evening as we remember the ministry and the work of the right excellent Sarah Ann Gill. We pray to God that you will continue to strengthen us as a community of faith, a community that you have called to spread scriptural holiness throughout the land and to transform the nations. That through these lectures and through this week, of heritage, reflection on our heritage, that you can again inspire us, find the flame within us as a Methodist community, a community of faith, that we can carry on the rich legacy and the traditions of those who have gone before us to pave a way for this great faith. And even this evening, Lord, as we reflect on the theme, and can it be, performing Barbadian identity through sacred music. We ask your blessings upon our presenter, Dr. Stefan Walcott, that you will give him the wisdom and the knowledge, Lord, and the clarity of speech and thought, that what he presents to us this evening, Lord, will be not only enlightening, but that it will be a message and a presentation, Lord, that would inspire us again to go into the world, to spread scriptural holiness in the land, and to transform our nations. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come now. Take your rightful place in this sanctuary and across the YouTube channel, and that we can identify your presence here with us through this lecture. And we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen and amen. As we continue to reflect on our her national heroine, we invite our bishop, Reverend Derek A. Richards, to bring the welcome and opening remarks. 
Reverend Derek. My dear friends, I greet you in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, head of the church and savior of the whole world. On behalf of the people called Methodists in Barbados and on my own personal behalf, I extend a warm welcome to all of you to this, the 14th annual Sarah Ann Gill Memorial Lecture being held here at the historic Bethel Methodist Church. Special welcome to our Master of Ceremony, Dr. Natalie Phillips, the Honorable Colin Jordan, Member of Parliament, Minister of Labor, Social Partnership, Relations, and the Third Sector, and also representing the Honorable Prime Minister, members of the Senate, members of Parliament, colleagues in ministry from within the Methodist Communion and other denominations, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen in the chapel, and those who are viewing via YouTube from across the world, the UK, the USA, Canada, Philippines, Africa, the Caribbean, and quite a number of other places in the world. Allow me to also extend a special welcome to our guest lecturer, Dr. Stephen Walcott, a brother in the faith, and he is going to be sharing with us on the topic, and can it be, performing Barbadian identity through sacred music. The Methodist Church of Barbados is pleased to present this public lecture to honor the life, ministry, legacy, and memory of the right excellent Sarah Angel. This lecture will contribute to the educational life of our country in particular and the world in general. Sarah Ann Gill was a social and religious leader, a woman, a Methodist, and today she is a national hero. She was one of this country's leading leaders, advocate for the well-being of all persons, combating inequality, including religious inequality, and a tireless anti-slavery campaigner who exposed, named, and challenged injustice. It is fitting that her name should live on to educate and inspire future generations. I'm so happy that these lectures are now available online so as to ensure that our children have easy access to the material in a format that they prefer. The topic for tonight is an important one, since Methodism was born in song. I believe, therefore, that I can say without contradiction that Sarah Ann Gill, like other Methodists across the world, sang the hymns written mainly by Charles Wesley, hymns that shaped their spirituality, revealed the brokenness of our society, and demanded decisive action in response to the socio-economic and political realities that ran counter to the principles of the kingdom of God. Charles Wesley's hymns emphasize personal experience in faith and personal response towards faith. He expressed the heartfelt yearnings of personal experience in his hymns in order to shape the faith of the worshiper's heart, including that of Sarah Ann Gill. 
in the hymn, Oh, for a heart to praise my God, Charles spiritually dissects the heart of the believer. Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free, a heart that always feels thy blood so freely spilled for me, a heart resigned, submissive, meek, my dear Redeemer's throne, where only, only Christ is heard to speak, where Jesus reigns alone. Charles challenged all Christians to step out of their comfort zone, to build a bridge with acts of compassion and justice for broken individuals, for the world to become more caring, more just. My brothers and sisters, what we sing helps to shape what we become, individually and as a community. Music shapes spirituality. Music shapes our consciousness and facilitates how we interpret our lived realities. Music determines what actions are likely to emerge out of our reflections on our lived realities. I have no doubt that this lecture will offer the church and the nation a refined tool for nation building and church development. And so again, on behalf of the people called Methodists, I welcome you and pray that you will find this lecture to be stimulating and deeply meaningful. Welcome. thank Reverend Richards for his phenomenal reflections on the national heroine and as we reflect on music. And as we eagerly await our guest speaker, I invite Sister Faith Brewster from the Dalkeith Congregation and a member of the committee to introduce the guest speaker. Sister Faith. Madam Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Natalie Phillips, the Honorable Colin E. Jordan, Minister in the, of Parliament, Minister of Labor, Social Partnership, Relations, and the Third Sector, Her Honorable Senator H. Elizabeth Thompson, Deputy President of the Senate, Honorable David Cummins Young, Barbados Ambassador to CARICOM. Guest speaker, Dr. H. Stefan Walcott. Madam Justice Sonia Richards. Archdeacon Eric Lynch of the Anglican Church. Reverend Derek A. Richards, President of the South Caribbean District Conference and Superintendent Minister of Jane Street Circuit other ministerial staff and their spouses, ladies and gentlemen in the chapel, and persons who are viewing on via the YouTube channel, good evening. Dr. H. Stefan Walcott is accomplished pianist, producer, composer, performer, and a young academic, with a focus on the popular music of the English speaking Caribbean. He holds a PhD in cultural studies from the University of the West Indies, UWI Cape Hill campus, where he is currently part-time lecturer. Stefan also tutors in Caribbean music, music history, and runs the Caribbean Music Ensemble at the Barbados Community College. 
Stefan has self-published three books, 60 Caribbean folk songs, 20 Bajan folks, and Caribbean composer handbooks, which are being used in the educational system in Barbados. He owns the only Caribbean music blog which discusses music and culture. Stefan Lee's 1688 Collective, a unique musical ensemble, and, a, and 1688 Dingole Inc. is not for profit arms, focuses on group childhood music education. Stefan is the creator of Handel's Caribbean Messiah, an original reworking of Handel Messiah, using Caribbean folk music and popular culture. He was also afforded a unique opportunity to lead one of Barbados national delegations to Carifesta and is the current director of the University of the West Indies Big Band. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. H. Stefan Walker. Thank you so much, Faith. I've actually known Faith for quite a long time, and she didn't add that part. Uh, we grew up together in the Methodist Church. And thank you so much for all who have come today. Um, I was explicitly warned, do not do protocol. Jesse, thank you. I listened to my mother, so thank you so much, everyone, for coming. <laughs> so today, guys, is all about Barbados. And I want to take you through a journey of this very unique space that we call home. We're going to be touching on varying times and places in our story as Barbadian people. And it's my wish by the end of it that we can have some sort of discussion and debate over the material presented. I'm going to tell you the story of an island some of you have heard of, an island planted between the Atlantic and the Caribbean Sea. An island with a people whose ancestors have survived the worst types of trauma and managed to survive and forge a better way for themselves. An island whose people came to think of themselves and perform themselves, and I'm going to be insisting on that part, the performance of the identity through a belief that things will be better. Today I present to you on the island and people of Barbados who, through Christian song, manifested who they were and who they wanted to be through music. The Barbados we'll be examining today is not the one of the Taino people. We'll be instead looking at this Barbados, the so-called bearded one, the one fashioned out of European greed and exploitation and the enslavement. The one we currently live in, our timeline therefore starts post-Columbus with the mad rush for wealth after Columbus's discovery. This discovery caused Western European men to leave the confines of their temperate prisons to seek riches in this so-called new world. It also set in motion a chain of unfortunate and sometimes unforeseen events, including the establishment of the plantation, the most significant entity, in my view, in the history of the Caribbean. The plantation is one of the most important social phenomena. We can look at this as the ground zero moment for our Caribbean culture. And for this discussion tonight, the moment when everything came into motion. In Barbados, our plantations were established around the 17th century. I see my history teacher here. The last history teacher I had, Mr. Jemmett. Um, if any dates are wrong, he's the guy that you can go and seek after. And our plantations were established to grow one crop for profit. 
the land was exploited, the people were exploited. And anyone know our crop of choice? What do we choose to engage with? And then on these plantations? Sugar cane. King sugar. And the plantation system had a very unique makeup, at least for, for the space. It was, a, it was a new phenomenon for us in the Americas. And we can have some of the characteristics here. The form might be a little small for those in the back, but every plantation throughout the region had a similar sort of setup. And the important criteria obviously impact our lives up to today. So for example, most of them were relatively large in size. So even for Barbados, they took up a lot of space. And uh, when you go to places like Cuba and Jamaica, the Mona Plantation, for example, where the University of the West Indies is on, you're just, I was just awestruck at how big these places actually were. So we have this large entity occupying a huge space. So immediately, it takes up a lot of psychological space for anyone who sees them. These are massive things for people, right? Especially people who have come from small growing crops in small areas to come and see these large entities set up on this sort of industrial scale. So just bear that in mind, the psychological impact as well as the space impact of these plantations. The other thing these plantations had were numerous unskilled workers, right? So you had a working class extracted from the Western and Central African areas, taken out to these plantations in large numbers. So that's the second thing that all the plantations throughout the Caribbean had in common. Also, the pattern of management organization being very authoritarian and very vertical in how it was managed. So in other words, you had an overseer who saw and looked after this work gang and then it just went up the chain like this. There's no spread labor uh, management systems in these plantations. Right? Very much vertically oriented. And these are some of the issues we are dealing with and grappling with today in the Caribbean. How to get around this type of management, a way of thinking about management. And I'm sure the minister here constantly battles these things. How do we get around this very vertical, very authoritarian type of leadership in the Caribbean? And finally, the rigid pattern of social stratification by people who do not look like you. So the plantation set in motion, people managing other people and dividing themselves not only on their type of labor, but how they looked as well. Right? So these legacies we are still living with today. We are still grappling with today. And this is not necessarily going to be the focus of this particular presentation, but I just want you to bear these things in mind as we look at the overall story and trajectory of Barbados. What we will be looking at though, in terms of the contribution of the plantation, is in culture. The plantation was responsible for bringing together, for the first time in human history, two cultures that were so geog geographically removed from each other and forced to inhabit a small space. It meant for the first time that Western Europeans and Western and Central Africans had to exist together, live together, negotiate each other. I mean, the systems of power were unequal, true. They were not on a level playing field or in terms of respectability, but they were forced to come together in the plantation for the first time. So what does this mean? This meant for us the creation of a completely new culture. This meant that the African and the European birthed something new in this space. Now, there are many words now in academic terms that are used to describe this process, but I love the word creolization because there was one theory proposed by Camel Raffet, who was a very influential thinker and an important Barbadian thinker, and I prefer to use that word because it just encapsulates what I see this process being the coming together of these two cultural entities in this space. So, the equation on the board, hopefully you're able to see it, of creolization 
is Western Europe meeting Western and Central Africa. Now, every year when I do this, in my, with my students at BCC and University of West Indies, I ask them the same questions. So what countries are we talking about here? What countries in Western Europe came to this region in order to establish this new culture? What, anyone can list some of the Western European powers? Anyone? England, yes, Mr. German is on point. Yes, France, Portugal, etc. Yes, and you have done better than my students have done for the last five years. Um, sometimes it's very challenging getting past that moment. I've heard countries like um, Italy, um, Russia, but yes, we have reached those countries that I'm talking about here. We're talking about the Western powers, the colonial powers that establish themselves. You have people from that area coming. Then we have people now from Western and Central Africa. Even though these were not countries at that time, can anyone list some of the countries now where these people were extracted from? Ghana. Oh my, we're on point. We are on point. We are correct. Ghana, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, which I affinity towards. Yes, all of these countries, right? So we have people come from these individual areas. And what happened in the plantation spaces is that new cultures were created. And not only in music, as we shall see later on, but also in food, in dance, they took various aspects, the enslaved people and even those from the non-enslaved experience and created this new creolized culture. So for Barbados now, our equation is British plus Western African creating Barbadian culture. In Cuba is the Spain plus the African culture that creates the Cuban culture. And as I tell my students every year, the type of culture is dependent on both of them. Right? So that's why in, in Cuba they have a guitar culture. They play a lot of string instruments as well because they're influenced by that southern uh, Spanish culture where the guitar is very prominent and is played throughout. So when it's combined now with the African culture, it creates a different type of Creolized culture. I know we'll be looking specifically at music just now, but I just want us to establish this, this Creolized idea, this two cultural parents coming together in the space of the plantation and manifesting itself differently in different parts of the Caribbean. One of the first example of Creolized practice in Barbados was the slave dances. And I want to really spend some time looking at these slave dances because they were a big part of plantation culture in Barbados among the enslaved people. The few records we have coming through always make mention of these dances and the prominence they took in the enslaved people's lives. Um, in doing this research, I was actually surprised at how important they were. In fact, some slaves, um, enslaved people, sorry, would prefer actual physical punishment over the chance of these slave dances not happening on Sunday. They would take that option instead because this was a big part of their coping mechanism within the plantation. So on these slave dances, we have people playing music. You, you have people dancing, that's the name of it, and you can have a picture, there's a picture depicted of what it may have looked like, right? And the descriptions of it describe particular drums that were used in this experience. Um, it was the event, it was the thing that got you through the week, if I'm looking at it from my eyes as an enslaved person. The chance on Sundays, and I'm emphasizing this, on Sundays, to engage in these slave dances, right? It was the thing to do on Sundays, right? <laughs> Control S that. On Sundays, it was the thing to do. And I must emphasize that the music in these slave dances was not African. We get um, descriptions of instruments like the banjil, the pump, the rukaw, um, that may have looked like African instruments, but they were instruments created for these slave dances in this new environment. So they had to be, they were forced to be, they, they, they had to be creolized instruments. These were not 
physical instruments, replicas, direct replicas of African instruments. There were new creolized instruments. In addition to that, there was the fiddle used and described in this period, which is a Western European instrument. So I'm saying this slave dance was the first real continuous in Barbados form of a creolized performance in this space. People come every Sunday, looking forward to it, jump on dancing, singing, all these kinds of stuff in these slave dances. So what did the music sound like in these slave dances? Um, trust me, I'm getting to where the sacred music is coming in. The music of these slave dances were based on the African principles of making music as well as the European way of making music. And it's this music that's the foundation of all Barbadian music to follow. All of it. Right? This is the foundational event. So it was a mixture of the Western African way of making music and the European way of making music. So in Western Africa, one of the key components, and it's pretty much agreed upon in most musicological research, is the use of polyrhythm and something called syncopation. We'll get to the call and response just now, as well too. But these elements are the major, major approaches used by Western and Central African people in creating their music. Similarly now, the Europeans utilize harmony, a certain types of melody, and melody is the most prominent set of pitches you hear, the one you sing in the shower, the one that you sound great singing in the shower with, that's the melody. And then now language now, is another contribution the Europeans made to this space. Because we have a situation where the Western and Central African languages are not permitted, so obviously you now the language is part of this foundational music of Barbados and of the Caribbean. So I'm going to break these down now because they're important in the discussion later on. Now, syncopation. Syncopation is when you play off beats between a pulse. What does that mean? I know I'm getting some glazed over eyes now. That's why I walked with some music to demonstrate what I'm speaking about. So Richard has me covered here, I am sure. So this is what I call the downbeat. So we get the pulse happening. And it goes like one, two, three, four. One, two. So can this side of the congregation please clap that with your hands? We have Mr. Giddens here. If you're in any doubt, so listen to him. Now that is the pulse. That's the main pulse. Now off beats now are the notes that come in between those notes. Now this is this side of the room. And I see an African here present. That's my wife. So any doubts follow her, she will have you covered as well too. So here we go. We're going to add the other part, which is the offbeat part. Look at my rhythm choir. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And stop. So we have now covered two major principles of Western and Central African music. Syncopation, which is the offbeat split over here, as well as polyrhythm. Polyrhythm is multiple rhythms happening at the same time, simultaneously. It is what gives the music of the Caribbean its unique sound, and that is derived from the experience of the enslaved, taking that knowledge to this space from Western and Central Africa. So once again, choir, let's go. So don't beat people, let's go again. Let's start the kick. Two, three, ah, uh, on point. And my office come in in three, four. And stop. So 
so polyrhythm can get really complicated. It's one of these things that confuses people outside of our culture. Because when we become a C or we go to tourists and watch them dance, they're not necessarily capable of perceiving all of the polyrhythm stuff that goes on. We will not go and digress further. So this is an example of multiple polyrhythms now stops. So there's a whole set of stuff happening now. And this is what the slave dance music was like. Multiple drums happening. People doing this, playing and dancing and singing and creating their own space where they were valued. So that's one or two aspects of African performance that are the foundational, is the foundational music now of Barbados. In addition to that, we have something called call and response. Call and response, back and forth singing, um, as it's sometimes known as, found in many cultures, believe it or not, but in Western and Central Africa, when it's combined with polyrhythm, we really start to get the essence of the music. So there are so many of these call and response structures in our music, popular as well as, as sacred music. Um, some of the popular ones you will not sing here, but you all know one, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Okay, now let's see if you can try that and clap your rhythms at the same time to see how much of our um, African DNA and slave dance DNA remains. Let's go. Good, thank you. Oh my, yeah, 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 you guys can finish it as well too. And I have just sung solo in a Methodist church for the first time in my life. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. So we have this happening now in the slave dances. And what we need to remember now is very repetitive. Sometimes repetition is used as a derogatory, derogatory term, and that stems from Another way of thinking, which we shall deal with later, but these things are very repetitive. Repetition is key to this music because if you have a call and response, the thing is it is supposed to repeat a lot of times because it allows people now to get into the pulse, to start to articulate it through dance and their body, which is a very, very key point within the slave dances as well too. So you cannot have all these words and all these things coming in and out because you're supposed to have a corporal response too this music. That was the intention. Right, so Western European harmony now. Now, Europeans are the ones who really developed and stretched the concept and theory of harmony. And harmony is basically just two notes played at the same time. Right, so let me see, I have something set up here. So that's an example of harmony. More than one not being played at the same time. Right? So we have this concept of more than one not being played. That may sound like, oh, that's the big thing about that. The Europeans exported this harmonic concept to the rest of the world. Originally, they didn't have harmony, but as choral processes went on, through the evolution, um, through the Roman Catholic Church. This is my other music history teacher there, Mr. Roger Giddings, who taught me this about 20 years ago. So if I'm wrong, check him. But the choral systems developed along that same path as well, through the church, and eventually they created a whole system of harmony. And harmony is what we spend a whole lot of time learning and trying to understand in music courses. And it's what people do when they come to do secondary school music is the harmonic concepts. And this is what the Europeans brought to our music, right? So call and response and all that polyrhythm is in the Western and Central African areas. Now we have the harmony coming into the music via the European tradition. So not only the harmony that they bring, they also brought the form of the songs. What am I speaking about, about forms? Now remember to this call and response. So in Western and African societies, they do not have 
like set number of times to do set to do the call and response sections. However, the Europeans brought the structure, this four bar idea. So if you look at the piece, twinkle, twinkle, little star, and you can sing the melody in your head, you will recognize it's in groups of four. Like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Multiples of two. This idea of structuring the form of the song is another European contribution. The form of the song, it what makes us create something uniquely Caribbean is that we have this form used as well as the rhythmic stuff. Then the final component and a very important one added was that of language. As I said before, the traditional African languages were not allowed to be spoken, so the European languages are what we sing in today. Either Creole forms or direct European languages. Those are the components that define the music and make it different than that of Western and Central Africa that was performed at the time. New culture, new music, plantation music. Now the hymn is one of the greatest manifestations of this harmonic concept and of structure. It's the way where the majority of the Caribbean, English speaking I'm speaking of, came to understand harmony and structure via the hymn, via the singing of the sacred music. So this hymn, A Thousand Tones to Sing, you can see from the bars as well too, has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 bars, a multiple of four, right? You didn't even recognize that, but it is. And it's a commonality among certain hymns that we love to sing in the Caribbean. Right? So the harmony, when people played, the organist played it, when they sung it, they created these harmonic structures as well too. Because the harmony and the form are a big contributor of the Europeans, or what the Europeans contributed to Barbados. So there we have it, guys. I'm not winding down, no, it's not the end. We have Barbados, right? in this early colonial, coming into the late colonial period. A Barbados now that has new set of cultural practices being performed. Being performed, right? As I repeat, being performed. These things were conducted. There weren't thoughts in people's head. It's what started to build community, the performance of these types of music. But it's not the Barbados we inhabit today, right? This was the colonial DNA that was established. In the next part of our story, I will be showing you how different sets of music being practiced reflected in the way the thinking began to change started to create a new Barbados. So I will refer to this. I'm not throwing this away. I will get back to this. Because we're going into the 19th century. And for us, the 19th century is one of the most important periods in the history of Barbados. The social changes at the end of the 19th, 18th, coming to the 19th century were profound for the enslaved and planters in Barbados. The planter class and those benefiting from the plantation economy began to be began to experience pressure from outside in the growing anti-slavery movement in Britain. In addition, smaller denominations in the 19th century started to come to Barbados to bring Christianity to the enslaved people, such as the Methodists. Clap for that, Methodists. The Haitian Revolution had also just started, and the slave dances began to come to the end, at the end, all in the 19th century. Right? As much as was, I would love to focus on all of the above, I have to exclude the impact of the Haitian Revolution to look further at the others in our Barbadian story, starting with the Methodist Church. With the push to emancipation in the beginning of the 19th century came a demand to convert enslaved people to Christianity. In 1802, an increased effort was made to expose the slaves to Christian education. 
a trend that was facilitated as more planters accepted the view that Negroes who converted to Christianity were by far the most honest, tractable, and moral of their color. And that comes from Handler and Frisbee. According to Blackman, um, that's the brilliant book by Woody Blackman that tells the story of Methodism. This wasn't done through biblical doctrine alone, but was also achieved by providing a wider education to the enslaved and their children. Now, this is life-changing. So remember the period leading up to this now, they do not have access to these things. They are cut off from these practices. The 19th century now, end of the 18th, ending the 19th, it begins to change. They now have possible access to education. They also have exposure to the Christian faith. Not saying Barbados is alone in this, but throughout the colonial world it happened, but the impact here was seismic. Because as recently emancipated Barbadians had access to this knowledge, their lives would change forever. They now had the possibility to read and write. A task when accomplished could give you access to privilege, access to a better way of life, access to humanity. Because you are now seen as being part of the Savior's blood, part of the process, the redemption process of Christianity. That is a massive psychological impact, a massive one. You are no longer framed by your enslaved position, but have access to something greater, something that you see benefiting people. Needless to say, the response to education through Christianity was immense for that reason. Like in the hymn, And Can It Be, the aspirational Barbadian to me was born. The one who was no longer framed by his enslaved position, but one who was now set free and granted access to humanity via their Christian faith. There's, no, there's perhaps no better example of this change of thinking than the new prominence of Christian practices and the abandonment of the slave dances. One magistrate of St. Michael wrote that the Sabbath was now respected and the Sunday dances came to an end. Remember, they're on Sunday. So now there's a change in thinking, new framing of thoughts. Sundays are no longer for the jump up and the dances and all of that. It is no part of your religious experience. So in the 40 years leading up to emancipation, the slave dances, which had been an essential part for so long, began to disappear. All in favor now of church services and the recognition of a Christian Sabbath. And this is the moment, ladies and gentlemen, this is the moment when a Barbadian self was born for the first time. To me, it wasn't the Arabaro moment. It was not August the 1st, 1838. It wasn't the plantations, which each of them cut off from each other. The Barbados as a nation was created when the original idea, this collective consciousness began to envelop the entire country. Is when people began to see themselves in relation to a different life, in relation to Christianity. It was when they became aspiring, they, be, they aspired to live this life. It was when their chains fell off and they decided to follow their interests in the Savior's blood. So remember now, I mentioned before, just light on the plantation, you have to perform this identity. How do you know? How do these newly found Barbadian Christians, these ones so passionate about their new life, how do they perform it? It has to be executed in the real world. And they used the method of song. When the reverend said that it was born through song, that is what he meant in Barbados. You have to practice it. You have to sing. You have to, to show that you have now come into this new light of Christianity. And it's made hymns. At first, we know the planters were hostile to the enslaved learning these hymns. But with the education came the insistence on learning hymns 
by rote, a practice that continued for many years after in our educational process. Right? I'm sure many of you in here have learned your hymns. Right? You can possibly list, I learned hymns at school, and I went to school a long after some of you in this room. Not too long after, just a little while after some of you. And it was this widespread adoption of hymns and hymn singing that brought this identity. It practiced this identity. It made this identity live. It was done through hymns. In 1833, for example, Roth attended a Moravian church in which she said there was a vast number of Negroes present. Note the year, 1833, with other reports saying how they sang the hymns with excellence. So you went from a period now of adhering to the, the plantation, the slave dances, to singing hymns now with excellence, according to Ralph. Um, it must be noted, however, that Ralph was not um, biased in his reporting. He was an anti-slaver and really wanted the, his readership to recognize that the, the enslaved people had souls and they were capable of practicing Christianity like they did in England. Another report said, um, this is from a novel, called Peter Simple, which describes a scene in Barbados where a Methodist meeting in Bridgetown comprised of black and colored people sung a hymn where the whole congregation a most delightful discord for everyone chose his own key. <laughs> now you can choose which description is more accurate. But they said a Methodist meeting in Bridgetown in this fictional environment, and I'm standing at a Methodist church in Bridgetown, but I'm sure, Reverend, he did not mean Bethel. He probably meant James Street or another church. Um, but seriously, either way, the widespread practice of him singing by the formerly enslaved within schools and within religious ceremonies shows that these Barbadians had fully committed publicly to performing this new identity. Don't worry, we're going to be singing in a second. I'm getting there. So we have now, just taking you back, the plantation system. We have the slave dances developing. Now we move on to the 19th century where the thinking begins to change. And obviously now the performance of the music as a vehicle of the performing identity also begins to change. But what became of Africa? What became of the slave dances and that type of music? Did they just disappear? This lecture is on sacred music and not on hymns for that reason. Because I am insistent that that did not just vanish. Even though some people at the time wanted it to vanish, and some people now maybe wanted it to vanish as well too, that polyrhythm or that type of singing, it did not disappear. And I think, and this is my thesis also for tonight, is that it did not at first come back overtly. It did not come in the polyrhythm and all this within the church space. What did happen though, uh, which I find to be rather fascinating, is that the choice of hymns that were liked and continue to be popular in Barbados and the Caribbean is still influenced by that slave dance aesthetic, that liking of certain types of slave enslaved people performance practices. What do I mean? So in the hymn, And Can It Be, um, it has a number of things we looked at earlier. The even bars, you say it comes from Europe. But there's a certain level of repetition that occurs in this hymn that does not incur, occur in other hymns which are not as popular and do not resonate as much within Barbados and other Caribbean countries. So if you'll go through the lyrics in your head, you'll sing it later, where you can see that the refrain comes back. Amazing love, how can it be? How can it be? And we get this line coming back, this idea of repetition, this affinity towards repetition was still present in these enslaved people. Now, there are other hymns that are not as popular within the Barbados space. Some may say, oh, I didn't know this hymn. It's, it is sung, etc. But I want us now, finally, to sing this one because I want to speak a little about it. So I'm going to play the introduction 
and then you guys should join in. Let me bring up the lyrics. All right, so here we go. We're going to sing this hymn, and again, I'm going to speak a little bit about it. Sorry, this has no introduction. Sorry. So go for it. popular with any Methodist space. I don't want to contrast the two. Before I contrast, I can it be. Let us look at this other one to God be the glory, which is another really popular one. And you recognize that in the first one, Thou Hidden Love of God, we don't get that repetition happening. We don't get that refrain coming again. We don't necessarily get the even number bars, which is also a thing in African music as well. So we still recognize that there are certain characteristics of the more popular hymns that bear similarity musically to that Western and Central African music making experience that came through the plantation. So you didn't even think about that. I didn't even think about that before I started to do this um, presentation. That these have similarities, right? So in To God Be The Glory, we get the similar characteristics of and can it be right we get the repetition again we get the repetition happening we get the repeated phrases we get in to god be the glory the call and response amazing love amazing love how can it be how can it be we get these things happening again in these hymns so when these people who are converted change their way of thinking to this christian experience now in many cases appearing to shun that Western and African slave dance experience, they were still, they were still using their taste that was influenced by that. In other words, the Creolized equation had not disappeared at all. Even though Barbados may have been called Little England, the reservoir, the underneath flowing of that African taste still remained. It went nowhere. And let us sing now to God be the glory because we're going to, I'm going to really drive home the difference between these experiences. So here we go. To God be the glory. We're only going to do one verse of this. Here we go. God be the glory. And when it comes to that refrain, it gets, it opens up the call and response section. I still remember, even though I was born much after 
this period of, of, of coming out of inter-emancipation, much after, I still remember being in Vauxhall Church, in Vauxhall people in the old church, as a youngster, and when that chorus came out, the church was rocking, man. And there were some older people that brought the Bajan accent to the praise the Lord, praise the Lord! And you get the full, the full Barbadian way of performing that hymn. The full Barbadian way of performing that hymn. And as we said before, so even though they wanted to, they wanted to shape their new identities based on this Christian path that they saw as being the, the way to wealth, the way to a greater spiritual existence. It still had the presence of that Africa within it. So this is the end of the, 17th, sorry, the 18th into the 19th century. And I want to finish now on the next period, which is the 19th into the 20th century. This is when we get the banjo. No banjo, according to Elombe Motley, um, he's described it as all Bajan traditional music, especially those songs with strong African rhythm. The banjo. I remember my mother telling me stories of her grandmother not liking the banjo in the church. I'm sure everyone has a story about the banjo. The banjo describes to me the real over, the obvious African rhythm, what we did at the beginning. When we did those, separated those rhythms and clapped them, the call and response then, that is the obvious banjo. And that also, the obvious one, now I'm not talking the one that influenced this, the obvious one did not go anywhere either. And in the 19th century, we had those songs still being performed in certain secular environments. How do we know this? Because we have a repertoire of folk songs which come at the end of the 19th into the 20th century that also reflect this type of rhythm, this polyrhythm that we looked at at the beginning. These forms of music show that some Barbadians still believe in a different type of existence, performing a different type of identity. In other words, they were still connected when they performed this overtly now into this plantation dance create, um, tradition. So an example of this overt banjo that comes from the 19th century, same time as the hymns were being sung, is this, um, for this folk song called Lick and Lock Up, which comes, is said, at the end of the slavery period as a celebration of this new freedom. So here's an example of it for those who are unfamiliar with the melody. I'm going to play it. There's a little introduction. Those that know it can sing it in their heads, obviously. example of the lick and lock up down there. Pure banjo, man. You got the syncopation in the melody, right? Um, I created this beat, of course, but you can just imagine the part of the rhythms we played at the beginning accompanying this. Fits like a glove, right? And this was also in the 19th century as well, too. This did not disappear, don't get me wrong. While there was a, a real change and a real gravitation towards this new Barbadian identity, this music was still around. And coming into the 20th century, a space that eventually, through time, managed to merge the overt banjo and the Christian experience was the so-called small church. Now, Kerwin Best defines 
the small church as being distinct from the big church. Um, so the big churches, according to the Caribbean Best, the Moravian churches, the Methodist churches, the Anglican church, while the small church, now the Baptist, the Pentecostal churches, those that have a different structure because they were literally small churches, little churches, as well as a different way of thinking and a different community that they served. Many of these small churches were rooted in working class communities, like real, I mean, a lot of places were still working class, but these were real plantation um, churches serving a very small communities, for example. And as more of these began to spring up, we began to see you now the, the, the infiltration of the polyrhythms and all of these into the small church music, right? And obviously, the vehicle by which you now it was began to be carried is through the psyche and courses in the service of song. Right? This comes in 20th century, developed through the 20th century. I cannot have time to dwell on each individual component, but that is the process. The small church is now bringing more of this more overt forms of banjo music to the church. An example, so to connect the dots, of a Sankey chorus is also a Methodist hymn is the song Christ the Lord is Risen. So I'm going to be playing this as well too and then talking a little bit about it later. again the repetition the repetition again the hallelujah at the end of each line a perfect sanky hymn a perfect way now you can see now where they start to, to merge back together because it is beginning to display the characteristics long in some cases forgotten on the plantation in these enslaved dances but it's still present within the music that resonated at these services of song Right? All of them, or a lot of them, show these characteristics. Repetition in line. This could be a call and response if you break it down and perform it in another way. A full-on call and response within this hymn. So as the 20th century went on, thoughts changed again. Different ideas started to become part of Barbadian people. And as you know, when ideas change, the performances of the music began to change as well too. So the 20th century saw significant events. It saw the Garvey's movement. It saw global colonial struggles being written about in the paper. People going against the imperial systems. Poets, the Camel Braffets, writers, the Austin Tom Clarks coming writing about the colonial experience in Africa, Chinua, Achebe, writing. All of these ideas began to flow. The University of West starts all of these things start to occur within the Barbadian space. And with an acceptance now of this African experience, the Banjo now is, begins to come full on, full in effect, back into the sacred spaces. We also had the spiritual Baptists who were taking the ceremony now of these African experiences in the sacred spaces, creating for themselves. And there's no better example of this period, this is the last period we're looking at, than the one and only, the great Brother Joe.
As my great grandmother said, he took the banjo back to church, right, um, mums? Take the banjo back, she did not like Joseph Nels at all. At all, at all. And that was a point that I made recently in a discussion I had that in certain territories in Cuba, the further back you go, the more African it becomes in the beginning of the 20th century. The further back you go in Barbados sometimes, the more rigid in colonial thinking, that first identity that I talk about that developed becomes more prominent. That more love of very traditional hymns, of chants in, in worship, in worship service. The chants of the, of the early Roman Catholic times, those ones that I cannot get played on the organ to save my life. La uh, la 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 la. And no structure and no rhythm that lose me. People in the earlier days loved those songs. I wanted to see them. Right? But with this new identity being created, because it was really taken up by the young, who I call the Barrow's children, those that, that, that saw themselves now in a new Barbados built upon certain African and Africanisms and are confident in it. So Joseph Nels expresses, performs that identity for those so aligned. So what does this all mean? Besides being a historical review of sacred music in Barbados, what does this presentation really say about the modern church? My hope after doing this is that the church in 2022, the Methodist church in 2022, becomes more aware of the identities that, that it constantly has to deal with. Because people think that once you are, or it is a Barbarian identity, everybody believes in it. No, all of these identities I spoke about exist simultaneously in this church at this point in time. There are some people that do not like the banjo in the Methodist church of the day. There are some people who only want the banjo in the Methodist church, saying, <laughs> All these boring hymns and this organ music. I and yet there are others now, I knew the identity has developed. The American aspirational identity. It is everywhere and has been for a long time in Barbados. And that has come into the Methodist Church too. Every time I go back to Vauxhall, I don't go often, right? But when I do go back, I am amazed at the hill song has now started to take over the worship service. I mean, there's long periods of people singing it, people performing it with their authentic self. I'm not saying they should not be doing it, but they really identify and perform that identity in the church space, that American view on Christianity. It comes in the speech of certain um, local preachers too, because the fantastic thing of, of, of the of the Methodist Church, we get a variety of speakers and, and, ident and, sorry, and ideas on the pulpit. So one day somebody will be really Hillsong, next day somebody will be really traditional. It's that variety in the church I really, really enjoy. And some people come with full on American accents. So you have people speaking, oh Jesus, son. And you get that, and then you get in that plus the Hillsong. And I'm like, where am I? Where am I? But however, however, those are things, those are authentic selves of these people. They believe in that. They watch the Trinity. They want to see that in the church. And I do not envy any church leadership, especially Methodist Church today, because to be able to consolidate all of these ideas of who they think the church, what the church should be, and who they think they are in a church space is very, very challenging. And it's one of the greatest challenges to me that confronts the Methodist Church and any institution that's been around for a long time, including the Barbadian state. How do we consolidate and make these voices feel that they're relevant? The American people, people who want to align themselves with everything on TV, the people who want everything from Africa, the people who want everything from Europe, these are institutional problems that challenge all of us. So to end, should a church seek to be relevant? Should a church seek to be unshifting in its ideas and its identity? Should it bring the 19th century ideas of Barbados to the fore? Should it be the modern one, the, the post-colonial one? What does the Methodist church, uh, how does it define itself in 2022? 
There are probably no definitive answers to that or even to the questions of Barbados as a whole. But what is needed is constant open debate and dialogue to the direction of the church through understanding and patience. We need to listen to each other and try as much to negotiate with each other in order to take this church and this country forward. Just be aware that people believe in these ideas not to be, to be stubborn, but they really see themselves and want to see themselves performed in the church and in the public space. Thank you so much, everyone. And I'm going to end now by singing the theme of today, which is And Can It Be? And we're going to do two verses in traditional form and then two banjo verses. So here we go. Thank you so much. sure I can start it from the point where the banjo comes in. Give me a second here. I'm coming. Okay. People want to make their own? I hear you. <laughs> All right. So let me turn this on here. It's amazing things to do at home and then all of a sudden. Okay. Here we go. All right, ready? So we're going to hear the last part. Hey, Banja, here we go. Oh, dear.
the applause that everybody agrees with me that it was a fascinating presentation. Those of you who are here and online. Standing ovation. <laughs> Dr. Stefan made us extremely proud this evening as he traced the historical review of music and we accompanied him on a journey as he talked about the, the music and the, the creolization of culture and he took us right through from the 19th century to the 20th century and he even mentioned the Caribbean puppet. Let's give him a round of applause again. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, it's at this point that Dr. Stefan will be fielding questions and we'll be fielding questions from here in the audience in the Bethel Chapel as well as online. Brother David Workman, who's upstairs in the chapel, he will be monitoring the questions online. But you'll be pleased to hear that we have 424 persons worshiping with us online. And... They're worshipping from Trinidad, Panama, Toronto, Brooklyn, and India. So we are, yes, we have persons worshipping from throughout the world, yes. All right, so those of you who are in the chapel, as you field questions, we are inviting you to come to the center by the microphone and ask your question or state your comment. And I will be alternating between here in the chapel and online. Okay, so we'll begin with the online, with YouTube. Sister Serlene Clark has, asked, has said, thank you, Brother Walcott. And she has asked, how would you define the balance between true worship to God and entertainment? How would you define the balance between true worship to God and entertainment? Um, that was a heavy theological question. Um, <laughs> the, 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 there's an assumption in the question that... Um, that one of them is true and on a personal level and my academic training always queries that is there really one true way of worshiping through history um it's changed constantly this this music we played is not plain chant or the gregorian chant of the roman catholic church which was seen to be the one true music Nothing else was allowed, not even an organ was allowed in those days. So I, I have real, great difficulty answering the question because I do not see that there's one true worship um, way, one true method. As I keep saying, identities have to be performed and they change from place to place, space to space. So a way of worshiping true inverted commas in the same India where somebody's following is not the same way we can possibly hope to worship here. And, and it has never been a case where there's been one method of praising and acknowledging the great being that is God and the eternity of him. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Walker. Are there any questions? Yes. Mr. Gemma? Uh, Walker, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thanks for a very, very enjoyable lecture. Um, I, I wasn't planning to come tonight, but uh, when I saw that you were discussing the question of identity, I said I really had to come. Um, I agree fundamentally with your thesis, what you're saying. I learned something from, from you tonight. I never thought I would be in a position where you'll be giving me a history <laughs> lesson. <laughs> but I, I didn't know that the, the, the dances started were, the slave dances were on a Sunday. And then when, in the late 19th century, um, the Pentecostal nonconformist churches came in, and um, the Methodists, the Moravians, the Quakers, and so on, then they started to push the Christian faith, um, partly it, to make the, the slaves more subservient. And, and that is one of the things about religion. Religion can either emancipate you, or it can make you more subservient. That is what Marx was saying that religion is the opiate of the people. But when the, Anglican, when the churches, non-conformist churches, began to bring in the black people, 
the black people embraced it. But the, what, what you are not, you didn't tie it in with the social, economic, and political structures of the time. And, and the black people joined the, 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 the big churches as a, because it, uh, it was tied in with mobility. With mobility. So if you wanted to get ahead, particularly from the black working class, if you wanted to climb up in, in the scale of society, as, as the uh, historian used to say, so you, join, you join that culture to acquire, to, to acquire mobility. But, um, and then I agree with you on this, and I've been saying for a long time, that the basic Barbadian identity was formed in that late 19th century by the schools, church, church and the church schools, mm -hmm. singing those hymns. I got, we got lashes at Wesley Hall one day, for a, singing a hymn called Fair Ways the Golden Corn in Israel Pleasant Land. And, he, and I, I don't know why we got, he kept us in late and beat us for, for, for not learning that hymn by heart, you know. <laughs> he, kept, he, he kept us in so late as a boy that messed himself because he uh, was saying, but that, 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 that is the frame of the Barbian identity that I grew up with. And when I was a little boy, my grandmother said to me, if you want to sing talk, you go in the ground. <laughs> and that's the first time I ever heard the word talk. And um, we are still divided by that. I, I go to JM Street. My wife dragged me screaming and kicking into JM Street. And um, I, 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 don't, um, I, I don't particularly like the Pentecostal thing. I don't like gospel music that much. I like the organ. I like Renaissance music. I like medieval music. Because that is what I heard my father playing in the house. We could not play a calypso in the house on Sunday. My mother would shout, turn off that! <laughs> you, you couldn't play that. So for me, Sunday was sacred music. Yeah. Psalms, hymns, and, and, and that sort of classical music. I love Baroque music because that is what I grew up hearing. And that's what my father liked, and that is what I grew up, grew up liking. But, uh, uh, but you're, you're right then, uh, we emancipated ourselves a bit now from that. And we, I'm glad, I don't know if you've ever read my book, Barbadian Culture Renaissance, um, in which I saw, saw the movement now where we're redeeming the black self, redeeming the black identity, and that has been a good thing. But the question posed by Seraline Clark um, just now was, is, 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 the, um, is this new church music more in keeping, more entertainment than it is uh, in keeping with spiritual death and worship? I have a great question about that. I think the entertainment is eroding a lot of spirituality in the church. Dr. Stephan, I really enjoyed your presentation this evening. Um, I would like you just, if you can, to speak a little bit more. I don't know how much of research you went into doing that, but um, I'd like you to speak a little bit more about the service of song. Um, and just to speak to one or two of the, the um, issues that came up about our use of these sacred hymns. Um, in, in doing some research, Dr. Uh, Professor Lamin told me that the work song, if there had to be a work song of Barbados, it would be the Anglican hymn. And I kind of thought, you know, let me challenge this a little bit. And I went to the radio and I asked the question about how we use the Anglican hymns. And Tony Thompson, the announcer, came on and said he had two aunts. And whenever they had a quarrel with each other, they used to use the Anglican hymns, the way how Trinidadians do pick on, the Anglican hymns. Mm -hmm. one, one aunt was married and the other was not. So the, <laughs> the married aunt used to sing all of the married hymns that she knew. No, I don't know these hymns. All of the married hymns that she knew she would sing because she was getting back at her spinster aunt, spinster sister. And the spinster aunt, when she would finish, would go on, push back the windows and start to sing all the burial hymns that she had. <laughs> <laughs> so could you tell us a little bit about how we use this, the Anglican hymns in the service of song, if you would? <laughs> uh, my, my research, I, I, was, I did not um, research in depth in service of song practices. I know there's literature out there, um, but I had to draw my 
line somewhere unless it will get to a gaily but is an area we'd love to go into later on as we revisit some of this um, what I find interesting about that story is the, the aesthetic of, of trading um, of this verbal back and forth pecan rather being rap tradition as rap battles is a long tradition in Africa it's a long the um, ambassador commission will tell you is that it goes back years in different cultures different manifestations in Cuba they have something called the decima which is the back and forth in lyrics as well too when you challenge somebody um, as I said Trinidad has a pecan is also found in, 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 in French um, Caribbean right and they use now the Anglican hymns to still carry on the ideology which is from fascinating they're using their training off using Anglican verses so in other words the thinking is still there um, of that African ideal but no it's just they're using a different vocabulary to, to execute it that was a great story Margaret thank you so much mm -hmm. I guess it's probably better to talk without the, the mask. Uh, uh, thank you, Stefan, for very entertaining and enlightening evening. I suspect that Mr. Jemmett really came surreptitiously to get the chance to sing banjo in the church. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want us to know. <laughs> but. Um, I'd just like to share just a little information. Well, the question as to when the mass of black Barbadians would have developed that Creole identity, if you read, say, Carl Watson, <clears throat> looking at 18th century Barbados, he has a book in which he, he describes the island back then. He makes the case for a fully developed um, Creole identity in the in 18th century Barbados. This book is called the Barbados the Civilized Society. Of course, Hilary Beckles writes about the same period of time and calls it Britain's barbarity time in Barbados. <laughs> so two people looking at the, <laughs> the same the same phenomenon and seeing um, two very different things. But the point is that the, we our historians do speak about a very definite um, Creole, I, black Creole identity mm -hmm. having been developed in Barbados as early as the, the 18th century. The other thing about these plantation dances, um, the organizing of the Bussa Rebellion was largely carried out at plantation dances. Um, as the enslaved had this opportunity on a Sunday to, to, to leave the plantation, to go to, to dances on neighboring plantations, they used that opportunity, Jackie and, and Bussa and all the rest of them. Because as you would know, the Bussa Rebellion was uh, um, very meticulously organized with leaders and cells on a whole host of plantations all across um, St. Philip and St. George and, and St. Thomas and St. John and, and so forth. And it was those plantation dances that were the opportunity. The real curtailment of the plantation dances came, after, came as a result of the Bussa Rebellion. It's not, that they, it's not that the enslaved just gave them up or they just um, you know, went away. It was that the planter class um, have recognizing that the enslaved had used the plantation dances to organize the rebellion. After the Bussa Rebellion, the planter class clamped down uh, on, on, um, on, the plantation, on the plantation dances. So that would explain why um, after 1816 you would see mm. uh, a falling away of the plantation dances. That, that was done by the the, the planter authorities in Barbados because they recognized it could be a, a source of rebellion. The, the final thing I would like to say is that yes, um, Mr. Jemmett is right. I mean, you go back and you read, you read the records. A lot of the Methodist missionaries that came out here, they had very precise um, instructions about how, to, how um, the, the Christian teaching must not be used to subvert 
the established social order. Um, however, if you look at the history of slave rebellions, not only in the Caribbean, but in the United States of America as well, you will notice that many of the rebel leaders actually took um, Christian teaching, biblical verses, whether, whether it's Denmark Vesey and Nat Turner in the United States, and, and several of them were actually religious leaders. I mean, Nat Turner um, was a deacon, uh, you know, a Christian deacon. You come, you come to the Caribbean, um, Deacon Sam Sharp, or the, the um, Paul Bogle, Deacon Paul Bogle in the Morant Bay Rebellion, in 1865 and even in Barbados even in Barbados there was a tradition among the enslaved that the right time they had they, they had so interpreted the Christian message in um, a liberatory way mm. that it was determined that the right time to launch a rebellion to liberate um, oneself was Easter time so for example the Bossa rebellion was launched on Easter Sunday the, the so-called Confederation Riots, 1876, or the War of, of General Green, was also launched on Easter Sunday. So there was that tradition within the folk culture of Barbados that Easter, with, it, with the, the, those spiritual elements of, of ascension and, 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 and redemption, was the right time to launch a liberatory struggle. Thanks. Okay, are there any further questions from the audience? Okay, and there are no further questions from the YouTube channel, but all positive feedback. Sister Patsy Crookendale, indeed, it was very interesting and enjoyable. Sister Colin Archer really enjoyed this presentation. Sister Sophia Drake, a job well done, Stefan. Sister Brenda Watson, very good presentation. Sister Maxine Pilgrim, very enlightening and enjoyable. Eureka Levine, great presentation, Brother Stefan. Abigail Brewster, fascinating presentation. Sister Angela Pollard, excellent presentation. Sister Sheila Wilkinson, yes, just a greeting. And everybody seemed to have enjoyed it. Oh, we have another, another, yes. Brother Anton. Thank you, Natalie. I didn't realize it was that easy to be missed. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Yes. Um, I want to add to the comments of those expressed both online and among us here for this presentation, Stefan, where you have really struck a chord, part of the pun, as far as heritage is concerned, because this is, where, this is what we are talking about, heritage, and looking at music in a way that can certainly make us ponder, as a church, where are we going? The question about worship and entertainment is really a vital question, because when you compare the different styles of worship and then within the Methodist or the Anglican for sure and then you go to the Pentecostal you think of entertainment more than worship in that confined form I have some personal experiences of such because I remember going to a small church um, it was at the end of it was to celebrate the, the um, election of candidates and I felt as though it was like for one straight hour, we were just singing choruses, choruses, choruses. And we were sitting up front so we can sit. It would look kind of like impolite if we sat while everybody was just standing and doing their thing. And it was so funny for me because when, when, when the uh, worship leader said, well, thank you very much, that's the end, I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> I had too much of that. And... Um, because I came from a background where my grandmother was Christian mission. So as you would know, Christian mission is a whole different sense of fever and rhythm and so on. My grandfather, Methodist. So I was in the middle of trying to determine which way to go. Well, as you know, I end up as Methodist, right? <laughs> but the point I'm making is that when we come to present day now, we have to find a way. And you made the point of consolidating all. The Methodist Church has to find a way of the appeal, finding the appeal and the attraction so that those ears that are really attuned to that type of music, 
It is not, it is not foreign to them and they don't feel totally out of place when they come into a sanctuary like the Methodist Church or the Anglicans for sure. My last comment as, you, as I go over what you presented to us is how we actually recognize that when we talk about our Barbadian heritage, I'm sure you will agree with me, if we use the spooge music, if we use spooge, that rhythm, that may very well ease our way into it. Vauxhall had a celebration, sorry, Providence celebration last month. And I had the pleasure of um, doing a solo at their concert. So I chose two songs. You Raise Me Up, very straight, and How Great Thou Art. And when I got to the rehearsal with the police band, we did who, how, You Raise Me Up. And then, how great they are. The police, one of the officers said, you're doing it the traditional way? I said, yes, of course. He said, nah, man, let me try something else. And you know, as an artist, you're always willing to try something else. He said, we can put this down in spooge. I said, yeah, man, let me go, man. And it went well. But when you spoke just now about the response, to my mind, spooge as ours, when we talk about heritage, I think that is one rhythm that we can certainly employ. You may all call it banjo. No, I don't really care. The point is that when we talk about heritage, when we talk about, when we talk about music, and when we talk about how can it offer such an appeal, I think that if we rely on that sound, which is spooge, then perhaps that's one way of easing, easing the division among our members, young, old, young at heart, not so young. And the same thing applies when it comes to theater in the church. Yes, theater in the church, how, how bold can you get? And we still are comfortable with doing things the way that has been, that have been done years and years ago, but theater brings change. It brings complete change. I would bet you some of us in here, if we were to use Bajan dialect, not raw Bajan dialect in every aspect, but in dispersing in our, in our presentations, some people were frown on that. But we have that set, we have to welcome, and we have to be proud of our heritage. And that, to my mind, is what matters, especially within this season of emancipation. But I congratulate you. And every time you present Stefan, I remember you. So, and I'm extremely proud. Continue the good work. Uh, I know you, you wanted to close, but I, I have to, to make this point of been stirred within me, Steph, for your presentation, like a, a bunch of nuggets of truth, segments that I'm still trying to, to digest and put together in my head into one orange. But in, in terms of if one thread that kept with me from when you started to the end was the word banjo. And I was so delighted when you you um, showed how then it came into the church in, in our, even in our present era. And how we even, with the deposit of language from the Europeans, colliding with the European language, how we, with the African language and culture, how we are still struggling even today with our present identities and our identities regarding our faith experience. And how, I mean, the woman at the well with Jesus had the same kind of challenge, what true worship is. And it is in spirit and in truth and not in the rhythm. So if we can understand that if we worship God from the heart, it doesn't matter. I mean, I remember going to worship in the U.S. with an Indian pastor, bishop, and when he was mounting to preach, he took his shoes off at the, the bottom and they went to preach because in his Methodist Indian culture, he does not preach in shoes. It is sacred ground for which shoes must not be worn. And I was shocked because my Bajan experience was utterly different. 
my faith experience with my, um, my nephew who's 17 who wants to express his faith with images that I do not identify with and we are grappling with these two tides of faith experiences trying to live in the same space. So you are right, we need to negotiate with each other and understand how it is that a word which meant an instrument, banjo, at the beginning now becomes an idea that speaks about a type of music and expression. I loved the way how you exchange the word express with perform. I think that's one of the things we are grappling with too because whenever we use the word perform, we think it is unauthentic. But when we say express, but then it comes from the heart. But you through, oh, I think you were deliberate in using the word perform. That how we performed and you said our authentic selves. I thought it was beautiful. And we are today in the Methodist Church 2022 grappling with the same tides as they grappled with in 1816, 1816 and 1833, in 1838, Barbados. We're still grappling with those ties who, were, who from my grandmother's generation joined the big church for status, but went to service and song on evenings with the little church, so to express and perform their identity. And that is a reality of our bear. Barbadian BIM experience in the faith experience where persons belong to more than one church. They belong to two churches and their children had to go to both. And then now we are want to be so high and mighty. <laughs> and you know, we still are grappling with it in, we, because of that which has been drilled in our head in school or by rote. We still don't understand that we are mentally tied to some of these identities of persons who were trying to enslave us. So it is wonderful. I am still trying to see how I'm going to change this into a sermon for our young people on Sunday when we're talking about heritage at Aldersgate because I think it is something that our young people have to understand that we who are older and who are older than myself, we are grappling with these same identity struggles that they are and how to help them to express it or perform it in a way that truly expresses their authentic self and an authentic worship, which is in spirit and in truth. So thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, we have a, another question that was posed on YouTube. Sister Heza Headley. She said it's, it's about the loss of our African identity through cultural penetration or imperialism. Dr. Stefan, can you tell us what is likely to happen in the future of our music? In the future of the music in Barbados or in the church? Um, I, I'm not sure which, which direction either one is going to go. Um, there are a lot of ideas and a lot of creativity around that's impacted by many spaces. Um, I think it will go to a more globalized voice um, because a lot of the children, my, my kids for example, they, they don't like spooch, unfortunately for Antoine, who just left. Um, and a lot of the young kids I teach as well, some of them, not those doing music, those because they had the pleasure of teaching an elective course, for those people who are just studying anything at the university, like physics or whatever, and you will be surprised or not really how much time they spend outside of Barbados mentally. In other words, they don't watch the news, they, they, they listen to K-pop, they watch K-pop videos, they watch YouTubers from the United States, um, after they go to church, they, they like Hill song. So in other words, they, they do not exist in the same space as we do, so there's no way I, I see those, those particular young people developing schools as their authentic voice because they don't connect with it. They don't connect to Brother Joseph Nels. They don't connect to, um, I am determined to hold on to the end. Right? They don't see that within themselves and, and, and they don't connect with it the way we do. So in the future, I see Barbados having multiple voices existing, especially as the Prime Minister pushes us towards this globalized space where she wants to see us. Um, we were going to be influenced for sure, for sure. There are a lot of different ideas and a lot of different 
paths in our journey as a nation. Okay, and she has a part B follow up question. Are we through cultural penetration or imperialism, or imperialism in, danger in danger of losing, losing the Af African identity? Um, African identity, as, as a perspective, is a very resilient thing. If it managed to survive 300 years of, of real attack on it, it will survive in the future. I mean, it is, I mean, it came out in the Anglican back and forth between the two aunts of Tony Thompson, and it will continue because it's based on a lot of orality. What you, what you hear and what you speak, so it will keep being passed down for many more years to come. I do not see that being um, directly threatened anytime soon. Okay, thank you, Dr. Stefan. Are there any further questions or comments from the audience? Right. Otherwise, again, once again, Dr. Stefan, I'm very proud of you for your fascinating lecture, erudite information. So round of applause one more time. Thank you very much. I invite Brother Anthony Barrow from the Rice's Congregation to move the vote of thanks. I cannot help but to utter the words of those disciples who looked at Jesus and said, it is good to be here. Madam Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Dr. Natalie Phillips, the Honorable Mr. Colin Jordan, Member of Parliament, Minister of Labor, Social Relations and the Third Economy, members of the Senate, members of Parliament, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen in the chapel, and those of you viewing by YouTube, good evening. I want to start by thanking everyone who have been involved in the planning of this lecture for the right honorable, for the right honor of Excellent Sarah Ann Gill, the hymns chosen, the prayers said, and their interaction help us in creating an atmosphere for a well-timed and informed presentation. I want to thank Dr. Natalie Phillips for the way she's conducted the evening's proceeding. Please give her a round of applause. I want to also thank the President of the South Caribbean District Conference, Bishop the Reverend Derek A. Richards. Please give Dr. Richards a round of applause. And Reverend Ralph, and Reverend Al Walcott for his opening praise. We cannot remember the lady who did our flower arrangements for us, Sister Wendy Darlington, and And also, I want to thank Brother David Workman for the work he is doing in transmitting our proceedings to those who were not able to make it this evening. <laughs> Dr. Walcott, when I, was, when I was a young boy at school, I was picked to go and see a production which is very familiar to us. In those days, back in the 70s, the cinema was a very popular thing. And our, my school teacher came in and she said, um, you all were picked to go to watch, to serve with love. She said that you all were the well-behaved students. We couldn't carry all the students, but she said you all were among the well-behaved students. And up to this day, the jury is still out on whether I fit in at that time in that category. But I got the opportunity to go. And at, in that picture, there was a song sang by the lady Lulu. How can you thank someone 
who have taken you from crayons to perfume. Tonight, through your, remind, through your reminder to us of our cultural and spiritual foundations, you have moved us to a lev another level. Methodism was something that was born in song. And tonight, you strongly reminded us of that. As I sat here tonight, I was deeply moved as I listened to you describe the different genres and the different elements of music. And, you know, I have often wondered as uh, a little boy and a, and a young man coming up, um, what got into my grandmother at Shrewsbury Methodist Church and indeed the grandmother of Roger who is sitting over there when there were apps uh, at the Sunday night service to lead the song session and quickly these two old ladies would jump up and rush to the front and start hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I mean it was simply beautiful um, but there was a certain amount of melody and harmony attached to it. And tonight you have explained to us what it is and where it came from. And so tonight, sir, it's, it's really an honor to have sat and listened to you break down and go through the history of our people, where we came from and what brought us to this point. So, so I want to thank you very much for your presentation and pray, pray God's blessing upon you as you continue to educate us as a people of our past and where we need to go. God bless you, sir. Your brother Barrow. I invite you to stand as we sing the closing hymn, Faith of Our Fathers, which will be followed by the benediction.
Uh, brothers and sisters, allow me before I pronounce the benediction to remind you or to inform you that we celebrate as a church Heritage Month during the month of May and this is the second activity for the month. I'm therefore extending a special invitation to you to James Street this time. So our lecture is taking place at Bethel. Next Sunday at 4.30 p.m., we meet at the James Street Methodist Church for the celebration of Aldersgate. Now, traditionally, the celebration of Aldersgate is a reflection on the conversion and life of our founding fathers, John and Charles Wesley's, and how their ministry touched the lives of so many people in the world. This year, our particular focus is on the life and ministry of the Reverend Shrewsbury, William Shrewsbury, and Sarah Angill. We have a special docudrama which has been prepared. We have been filming across Barbados for the last month or so. A number of persons have been involved in doing the research, and I can tell you it is a compelling story that needs to be told, and you need to be a part of this experience. You need to have a better sense of who we are and where we are coming from and where God may be leading us as we continue to contribute to the shaping and the development of Barbados as a republic. The Methodist Church has made a tremendous contribution to the development of this nation. And I say to you that God is not finished with us yet, that this is a season of resetting. So that is at James Street Methodist Church on Sunday at 4.30 p.m. Then the following Sunday, we move to the Ebenezer Circuit to St. Philip, to the Beulah Methodist Church, and there we will have a special event where we will honor the work of our brother Roger Gittens, who has contributed, <laughs> yes, who has contributed significantly to the development of the Methodist Library, Music Library, and Roger's work has, he has been working very quietly and silently, but a most profound piece of work that will bless the entire Methodist Church, not just in Barbados, but across the Caribbean and the Americas. When I think of Roger's work, I see the, the future of singing in the Methodist Church. And we bless God for him and for the work, and so we will celebrate his work in a very special way. So those are the events that are upcoming for the celebration of Heritage Month. Receive the benediction. And so now, God, we bless you and give you thanks for the ways in which you journeyed with us through this time of reflection led by your servant, Dr. Stephan. We thank you for him and for his work and pray that you'll continue to bless and prosper him in all that he undertakes as he too contributes to the development of nation building and establishing us as a people of God in this part of the world. And so, Lord God, as we leave from here, help us now to reflect on our own personal contribution to the well-being and development of our human society. Help us to know that you have gifted us with grace, gifts, talents, and opportunities to make a difference. And so now may God the Father bless you. God the Son save you. And God the Holy Spirit keep company with you now and forevermore. And the people of God say, Amen. And amen. God bless you all.